Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Rick Games video, video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with further NVIDIA Turing leaks. Specifically, these leaks actually tell us much more information regarding overclocking of Turing, along with shader performance, which has been one of the big question marks. Now, you might recall that yesterday I actually covered a series of benchmark information that had popped up both from NVIDIA themselves and third parties. Now, in that report, they had said that the RTX 2080 would be capable of running most games at the highest quality settings at 60 FPS or more, with uh, third parties collaborating those facts along with adding to this by saying that the RTX 2080 Ti, or Ti if you prefer, was capable of actually hitting up to 100 frames per second with all of the quality settings at max. If you need a refresher of that and much more information, you can find that linked in the video description or in the comments below, along with the corresponding article. But fast forward to today, and there have been another set of leaks, and this is actually from the editor's day, uh, which NVIDIA have been sending out to certain members of the press. Now, what this Editor's Day information does is it tells us a couple of things. The first is the shader performance of Turing versus Pascal. And bear in mind, this is per core shader performance. This is not like, well, all of these CUDA cores of Turing versus all of these CUDA cores of uh, Pascal. No, they're apparently uh, accounting only for per core performance. We'll get into that in just a moment. And combine that with a whole bunch of other information, including the specifications, which we're going to be starting things out with, uh, with the TU-102. So the TU-102 has 72 SMs and a grand total of 4,608 CUDA cores, 576 tensor cores, 72 RT cores, which is very helpful because we did not know that number, 36 geometry units, we also didn't know that number, 288 TMUs or texture mapping units and finally 96 ROPs and unsurprisingly we see 384 bit memory bus interface running at 7 gigahertz which of course is 14 GBPS because well it's GDDR6 memory all of that makes sense oh and support for two NVLink connectors <coughs> of course that's the full fat GP102 core. That is the type of core that will be found in both the Quadra RTX 6000 and the 8000. And Nvidia have made some concessions when porting this down to the GeForce lineup. I suspect that this is probably for yield reasons. In other words, the cores that would be capable of running fully fledged, they of course can be used for Quadro, and cores which have a few SMs disabled, well, they can be brought down to the GeForce lineup. So what do we have for the 2080 time? We have 4,352 CUDA cores that we already know. This means that we have 68 SMs. That, cons that does confirm the number of uh, CUDA cores per SM as well. We also see 544 tensor core units, which is nice to know, 68 ray tracing cores, which is also good to know, and 34 geometry units, and 272 TMUs, and finally 88 ROPs. And from the looks of it, and of course, one of the memory chips has been removed, so it goes from 384-bit memory interface down to just 352-bit, with 11 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory. All of that's really cool information and does, of course, tell us at least some of the specifications that were mysterious before, such as the number of ray tracing cores and that type of thing. But another really cool thing that had been leaked, thanks to the folks over at Video Cards, is shader performance. Now, this was a really big question mark. As I just mentioned a few minutes ago, one of the benchmarks NVIDIA have released officially is to say that, look, our games are on the 2080 or whatever is going to run significantly faster. And they have done this with DLSS. They've got that as a separate graph. And then they have the 2080 RAW and they have the 1080. Now, this graph, which is once again counting performance of the shaders, the CUDA cores, uh, they are alleging it's a one core to one core type of thing. Uh, well, you can see the difference here. Uh, obviously, it does depend upon the benchmark of Ashley of the Singularity doing worse, Sniper Elite doing pretty darn good, and VR Mark up to, well, just slightly over two times the performance. 
In short, at least in raw shader performance, we're looking at around 1.5 times or slightly better. Once again, very much depending upon the benchmark and the game. As a slight note as well, you'll also notice NVIDIA's choice here to choose most titles which were DX12 in code path. I'm unsure whether that was deliberate or whether that's NVIDIA subtly telling us that this GPU does a lot better with DX12 perhaps than legacy titles. So possibly, and I would be very curious to see how this would work with a very graphically demanding game like, let's say, Crisis at the highest quality settings at 4K, would we see a lower performance here? Or is it because of the drivers? One of the uh, reports as well that's going around is the reason that we've not actually seen a lot more leaks and benchmarks from NVIDIA is really simple. They are not confident yet in the state of the drivers and they are essentially engineering very early beta quality drivers, which is not particularly surprising. It also means that very few people actually have their hands on the car on these cards and they can't even run benchmarks because their drivers are in such an early state. They're just not any, well, they're just not in the realms of possibility to really do that. NVIDIA are not planning to release uh, press samples until early September. And furthermore, the NDA does not lift until the 14th. So obviously there's probably a couple of reasons behind that. One, that the architecture is significantly different. So it gives members of the press time to actually acclimatize and realize what is actually going on, which is different than the cards. We'll get into some of those details in just a second. And furthermore, it probably provides NVIDIA a little bit of extra tinker time. So let's say, uh, the reviewers get the cards. I'm just making this up on the 5th of September. Well, let's say that on the 10th of September, NVIDIA released a different driver as a reviewer you sometimes get beta drivers sent and sometimes that'll be via Dropbox or sometimes it'll be via an FTP with a specific login or whatever. But the whole point is that you get these drivers and sometimes they can be updated within just a couple of days. And the same thing can also happen with BIOSes as well for graphics cards or motherboards. We've actually had to do that before where we had to actually flash a, um, a graphics card BIOS because a slightly updated one, which is slightly more aggressive clock speeds. You get the idea. Um, so all of that is kind of frustrating for users and does once again go back to the fact that NVIDIA are asking you to pre-order now. Uh, we can get into the pricing information as much as you want and whether you feel that you're overpaying or not, that's totally down to you and your wallet. The biggest issue I have with NVIDIA over the event and how they've handled all of this is I just don't think they released enough information when they opened up the pre-orders. If they'd have provided these slides, a couple of these slides during the press conferences said, hey, look, we're aiming at a 40% or 50% or whatever performance advantage with this and with DLSS. Oh, and by the way, I've had a number of people asking me to explain what DLSS actually does. If you do want me to do that, feel free to have a comment in the video or I'll try to remember to leave a straw poll as well. But regardless of all of that, the fact of the matter is, I think if NVIDIA had done that, the press conference would have gone down a little bit smoother. That's just my personal opinion though. A lot of folks have heard of MSI Afterburner and EVGA Precision. Well, there is also EVGA Precision X1, and it is using the base of a new NVIDIA application, which is known as NVIDIA Scanner. Now, in my opinion, this is a really cool piece of software because it adds to what NVIDIA have already been doing with the GeForce Experience. So if you don't know, GeForce Experience does a very good job of optimizing games. It doesn't necessarily do it as well as what you could do manually, but it does a fairly reasonable job of saying, well, okay, you have this graphics card, you have this processor, you have this display, here's the settings that we recommend for your game. And it will configure them automatically. It will change the game's configuration files, which is great for people who don't necessarily know much about PC gaming. It just, or if you've got a new graphics card, or perhaps a new game, it gives you a basic understanding of saying, okay, well, this is probably what I'm gonna uh, need to roughly run this, the game on, maybe a little bit more uh, higher quality if you're overclocking, but it gives you a basic foundation of what you're doing. But according to NVIDIA's own data, most individuals do not overclock. And according to NVIDIA's own blog post, that's one of the reasons they're releasing overclocked versions of the card and the extra 90 megahertz. <laughs> There's still so many questions I have regarding that incidentally, like <laughs> what happens if you BIOS flash? Does that mean that all cards are really capable of this, but these are just the ones that they've released those BIOSes on? Are they cherry picking silicon or are they just releasing these cards and all car, all GPU cores are technically capable of running on that? 
So essentially that's really the clock speed and you're just paying for what really the GPU can do. Or does it also affect the maximum overclock? Now that is something that I'm gonna be very curious in. So for example, if you overclock uh, two GPUs to RTX 2080s, uh, for example, and we, or let's say we had like 100 RTX 2080s that are the OC versions and 2080s, which are non-OC, the vanilla versions. Is there going to be a difference in maximum core clock? And could you, uh, in terms of the average, and can you also get a similar result by flashing one BIOS to the other or manually tweaking it? Anyway, getting back to the story itself, Nvidia are actually releasing what they consider to be the Nvidia scanner. The name's still pending and I really don't like the name. Now this, it's actually really cool because what it does is it sets the clocks for you. It will scan, test what it feels the your silicon, which is Turing, uh, can actually run at maximum. Now, what's really interesting is that a screenshot from EVGA Precision is showing a core clock of 2105 megahertz. If <laughs> that's even a slight indicator of what these GPUs can do. That's pretty darn impressive. That a bit, that basically means you're getting like three or four hundred megahertz on top of the, what the GPUs are going to be capable of at retail. That's pretty darn nuts. I mean, yeah, I obviously I don't want to start getting performance metrics and how it's going to overclock because, for example, it's possible that the core could overclock really well and the memory could just overclock really terribly or perhaps vice versa. And we don't know how, let's say, memory bandwidth style of these GPUs are going to be and so on and so on. But still, if they are capable of doing that and the core does a really good job of actually figuring out what its maximum clock speed is, that's really good news for gamers. Uh, because let's say that you buy an OEM uh, system with a GT, with an RTX, excuse me, 2070. It means that within just a few clicks, if you don't know much about PC gaming or you have a friend that doesn't know much about PC gaming, within just a few clicks, all of the resolution settings will uh, select themselves, the quality settings, as well as that the system will configure its automatic overclock for you. And that's even better if you happen to have something like uh, a 2700X processor, which also does a really good job of actually overclocking itself, particularly when you start taking Precision Boost Overdrive into account. So it's really cool. And does open up another discussion whether manual overclocking is starting to be phased out a little bit. Oh, and a slight aside, Nvidia themselves have also released a press statement and this press statement just wants to clarify, so I'm gonna just add it in here. The RTX technology does not necessarily just mean ray tracing, it also includes AI stuff like the DLSS. So games which have real-time ray tracing, this is pretty much uh, at launch or close to launch or JX3, Justice Enlisted, Control, Battlefield 5, Atomic Heart, Metro Exodus, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and so on. And games which support NVIDIA DLSS include Ark, Atomic Heart, Final Fantasy XV, Hitman 2, uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, We Happy Few, The Forge Arena. So it does look like games like, let's say, Final Fantasy XV does not support ray tracing, which is a bit of a shame, at least in my opinion. Undoubtedly, one of the underdog stories, of course, of the past 12 or so months is AMD rabbit punching Intel. And they've not just done it on the desktop arena. By the way, in the next couple of days, we're going to have quite a lot of uh, reviews regarding AMD's CPU products. So do check that out if you want. But also in the server market as well. Epic is doing a marvelous job of undercutting Intel. And it's not just doing it because of pricing either. But the fact is the performance is pretty darn impressive. And with the additional IO benefits as well of Epic, it's fair to say that Intel are a little concerned. But to be fair to uh, Intel, it's not just AMD that's causing the issues. It's actually, well, Spectre and Meltdown. And we know about those security vulnerabilities, so I'm not going to uh, repeat them ad nauseum. But essentially, when they were mitigated, performance was impacted. And Intel do not like that and in fact have updated their licensing to actually tell you that you are prohibited to benchmark the performance impact of these microcode updates. The updated license code for the microcode update has a rather unhappy sounding sentence. You will not publish or provide any software benchmarks or comparison test results. That's upsetting perhaps to you as an individual, 
but it's also going to really upset companies like Amazon and Google and Microsoft because, of course, they have cloud-based compute systems. So one of the things they were doing when the whole um, palaver was going around, they were saying, well, OK, here's what level of performance you can expect to grade in what areas. And Microsoft, for example, had a whole set of blog posts they were releasing to say, OK, here's the performance issues on server. Here's the performance issues on bog standard Windows 10. Here's what happens if you're running highly uh, parallel work. Here's what happens if you're running, you know, bog standard games and so on and so on. And of course, it was part of their duty because they are ultimately responsible for licensing out CPU time and compute time to clients. And those clients need to know what the performance detriment is. So for Intel to actually put that in, well, I'm going to let you decide how uh, the ethics of this. I know how I feel about it. It's not great. And I'm going to be very curious to see the legalities about this. And also, is it even enforceable? Because it becomes really silly. Like, Let's say that you run a benchmark and then, um, you know, three weeks later you run the same benchmark to test something else out. Well, obviously the CPU might be involved in that. So, you know, it, it just gets a little, it just gets absolutely crazy. And quite frankly, I don't think it's going to be particularly enforceable. Obviously, they're not going to track down, you know, John on a forum somewhere for this type of thing. But it's going to be very curious to me, not necessarily how a standard reviewer is going to be kind of held accountable for this. Instead, it's going to be more curious how a company like Microsoft or how Amazon are going to respond. And I think it's actually a case of like you're trying to silence someone and it's actually the wrong thing to do. You're better off working with the people and just embracing this issue, saying that you're trying your best to mitigate it. You know, the new architectures are coming up and all of this stuff, because what you're doing is actually frustrating customers. And <laughs> yeah, uh, AMD are like, hello there, we have this new technology. It's called Epic. And, Ep and AMD is then in the background like, oh, and by the way, we're moving to 7nm soon. He, he, he. And also we're going to be upgrading our core count. He, he, he. In other words, it's just not good to do that when not only are you frustrating people on the fact that they're needing to deal with the performance loss and the vulnerability issues, but then you're also frustrating them by them not even being able to inform their consumers of how all of this works. And then AMD are going to be next year releasing 7NM. It's a really silly move, at least in my opinion. Anyway, with all of that said, hopefully you have found the video informative and useful. If so, normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe. Oh, and by the way, thanks to everyone recently who has been commenting on Facebook. Uh, you can find us, by the way, of course, on social media linked below. I'm typically easiest to reach on Facebook just because of how I've got my phone and everything set up. You can, of course, feel free to tweet the official account, but Amy is generally the one responsible for that. And just generally, thanks for all of the support. I'm going to quickly mention that we are on Patreon. That's not to say that you have to donate. Just saying that if you fancy uh, just having a look at the page or consider giving a dollar a month, that would be greatly appreciated. But if not, do know that just watching this content is very appreciated. And it's kind of humbling, to be honest, just how much uh, positive reception we've been getting recently. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video and take care of yourselves.